the woman who uh, helped you with the uh, travel arrangements. Everybody was born at a very specific time in a very specific place, and we overlap an awful lot. But consider that instead of one unified reality, that we have intersecting realities. That was just a random thought. So you can actually map out in the universe, in the galaxy, in the solar system, exactly where you were born and exactly when, what the stars looked like at that time. And I was thinking about the uh, Milky Way galaxy, and I, I'll tell you what, a lot of people have been complaining about the way things are headed in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, I get it. I get it. We have our problems, and I see those other galaxies are keeping their distance, you know, maybe for good reason, but I'm telling you what, do not mess with the Milky Way galaxy. This galaxy will kick your ass. We see you, Andromeda. We see you creeping. You know how many solar systems we got up in here? Like at least 3,000. Sure. Sure, we've had our troubles over here in the old Milky Way or the M, um, uh, the MW, as we call it, over here. You know, we've had some problems between different solar systems. And yes, most of our planets don't yet have life. But we are very plucky. And we do unite when faced with threats to subvert the way that we like to run our galaxy. Some among us say that in drama the Andromeda galaxy is right to collide and uh, collide with us in about 4 million years. But I disagree. Who gives them the right to come bashing into us? You know, we're, we're just over here minding our own business here in the Milky Way, doing Milky Way things. But Andromeda has got to roll up on us. And I say we draw a line in the universe here. All right. The version of galactic history that I learned says that, yes, there are hardships, but there has also been progress. While those jerks in the Andromeda galaxy might think our galaxy was founded in immorality, I say the history of the Milky Way galaxy is one of progress. We used to be just space dust, and look at us now. The planet I was born on Earth used to be molten lava. Get some perspective, people. So... Progress has not been fast enough, for sure. But I believe this galaxy can rise to the challenge as we have in the past. And I know we're only 52,000 light years across and just a very young 13 billion years old. But we are very, very plucky. So don't be too quick to despair. The universe isn't going anywhere at least not for a while. And you've got like four or five billion years to get ready. So we see you, Andromeda. We see you. Getting back to UFOs. In a best-case scenario, we become the UFOs. Our species proliferates throughout this solar system and even this galaxy one day. People are working on this. I'm looking at you, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, this is a bad joke, but um, I heard uh, it was great news that Jeff Bezos got shot into space, and it was horrible news that he returned. Oh, jeez. All right. But I'm bum. All right. So I'll leave you with a thought experiment before the break. A, uh, a professor once asked students, what if you were the UFO? What if we make it to other worlds and we find a more primitive life form? What do we do? Do we just observe? Do we greet them? Do we try to help them? And if they're delicious, is it okay to eat them? These are the questions we raise that no one else is asking. And there's more where that came from on the next block. On the B block. We'll call it the B block. There's three blocks. There's A, B, and C. That was the A block. I hope you liked it. Coming up, we have B and C. 
please check out the Steel Plaza podcast. Please check out Darkest Corners of the World music podcast. And uh, keep those cards and letters coming. Um, again, check us out on PayPal. We have stopped using PayUpPal. It's just way too heavy-handed. So, thank you. Welcome back to Andy's Philosophy Corner. And vice versa. UFOs. UAPs. Unidentified. Identified aerial phenomena. What is it with adding more and more and more syllables? Euphemisms. That's what I'm talking about. We keep changing the name for things. Which makes it quite daunting. Now, I'm a big fan of the fact that the English language has so many words. So very many words. But it can get a bit slippery, especially if the meaning of words changes over time. People can use the same words, but they can denote and connote different things by the use of the English language. Studies of formal and informal logic can help you out through this. I could go on and on about informal fallacies. But if you were ever skeptical or cynical, just go to uh, the internet. Go to your Brave browser, which is in beta right now, and type in informal fallacies. What you will find are, depending on where you go, at least two dozen varieties of fallacies and once you become familiar with these types of informal fallacies you see them everywhere you see them used everywhere in um, spoken and printed I'm here to make you more cynical all right so um the government released some vague confirmation, or at least the report confirms that there are flying objects that continue to defy identification. As I have mentioned earlier on this and previous podcasts, there's a lot of information you will never find on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google, on YouTube, or even Spotify. I really encourage you to use a blockchain browser, such as Brave. There are many other good ones. I think Brave really nailed it. Brave was identified by futurist George Gilder, and I encourage you to check out his book, Life After Google. Futurist George Gilder talks about the importance of blockchain and how blockchain really changes everything. It's the information age. Get the new stuff. You know, this isn't uh, 1998 where you got a CD you got to put in your computer and your modem makes a sound exactly like a duck choking on a kazoo. It's not that age anymore. We're way, way, way past that. So, Again, these are not sponsors. This is friendly advice or maybe persuasion or encouragement to explore. So much of the information and content that is out there is, in fact, at your fingertips. It's the information age. Two or three clicks, seven or 11 keystrokes. In 10 seconds, you could be searching Odyssey for things you will find hard or impossible to find anywhere else. So, a question that comes to my mind when thinking of UFOs and does alien life exist, if we're talking about existentialism, we must mention Soren Kierkegaard. Soren Abai Kierkegaard was born the 5th of May, 1813, he died November 11th, 1855, and he's still dead. He was a Danish philosopher, theologian, poet, social critic, and religious author who is widely considered to be the first existentialist philosopher. 
He wrote critical texts on organized religion, Christendom, morality, ethics, psychology, and the philosophy of religion, displaying a fondness for metaphor, irony, and parables. Much of his philosophical work deals with the issues of how one lives as a single individual, giving priority to concrete human reality over abstract thinking and highlighting the importance of personal choice and commitment. Two of his influential ideas are subjectivity and the notion popularly referred to as leap of faith. However, however, the Danish equivalent to the English phrase leap of faith does not appear in the original Danish, nor is the English phrase found in current English translations of Kierkegaard's work. Kierkegaard does mention the concepts of faith and leap together many times in his works. But I think we should probably lean on subjectivity as his more influential idea, which of course ties directly into Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason, what we know, our reality. All outside stimulus comes to us from our five senses was Kant's theory. I'm not saying he's right or wrong. Seems like a nice enough guy. Who am I to uh, uh, go after him? You know, he never did anything to me. So, subjectivity will probably be very familiar to listeners of this podcast. Immanuel Kant likely said the seeds of Kierkegaard's subjectivity with his own thoughts on the world we experience through our senses versus the real world that actually exists beyond our senses. It's never a bad time to remind everyone that you cannot prove that something does not exist. I believe it's called the null hypothesis. For example, uh, we cannot prove Santa Claus does not exist. You cannot prove life on this or that planet does not exist. You can't prove something doesn't exist because it's a pretty big universe. Yeah, it's pretty big. You got to check everywhere. You, <laughs> The universe is too big to, in any form, state that this or that does not exist. I just think that's good to keep in mind. So... In the summer of 2021, the U.S. government decides to release its report on UFOs. And so why now? Is this a distraction? Why now? I was on a radio show years ago, and we had a great skit, which I referred to earlier, which was basically called, Don't Look at That. Look at this. So consider where you direct your attention. Consider how you use your time. Consider what you seek out on the internet. Consider how you spend your time online and how you represent yourself online and where you go to get information and what sources of information you consider to be reliable. Here's a big, big hint. If your information source has been forced to retract once or twice or more than that, if it's been more than once or twice, you need a new source of information. Too many people just get the one story and they're invested in the narrative of that story. You're, you're too invested to deviate. You'd rather not know. You have an excuse for not knowing. After all, you've been misinformed. Don't you have an excuse? Well, it wasn't my fault. That's what they told me. Well, you got no excuse. It's 2021. You can search. You can be private online using blockchain technology. You can find out. And I think if you care about the betterment of our species, I think 
that you should become as informed as possible.